California. Look like the sky don't wanna cry. California, y'all. Look like the sky don't want to cry. And ask the Lord to help us. And please send some rain our way. Hi, I'm Mark Hummel, and this is Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party, and we are brought to you tonight by Seidel Harmonicas, Electrify Records, and Mountaintop Records. And I am sitting here with uh, somebody I've known for years and years, a guitar great. He's on so many uh, recordings and played with the, the top, top players in... Uh, the blues music industry. Uh, this is Junior Watson here. And Junior is gonna tell you a little bit about uh, how he got started and some of his experiences playing, who he, who he played with, stories about the road and just all kinds of tall tales. So uh, the first thing I wanna ask uh, Junior just to get things started is, is uh, you grew up in, in Visalia? No, I was born in Visalia. I grew up in Tulare, the Tulare. next town over. And, uh, That's the San Joaquin Valley, Central yeah. Coast, they call it. What was your attraction to music as a, as a kid? I'm assuming you got into it as a child. Well, I'm Portuguese, you know, and, and you know, like I was telling you earlier, that town was pretty diverse with every nationality. Everybody got along. And I had some Mexican friends that I was going to Catholic school with, Paul Trujillo and his, and his family. And he was messing around with the guitar. He was ba basically just beginning. And when I heard these guys play, I said, man, I got to get me a guitar somehow. So my grandfather takes me to White Front. That's like a... Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's like a, yeah. a Walmart back right. then when there right. was no Walmart. Right? So I bought a guitar. It cost $50 and $49.95. And the amp was like made out of cardboard. It was a terrible. It was called a Rodeo guitar, right? You know, I saw the one on a... There was actually three of them on stands, you know? So I come home, and it only has two strings on it. So... They thought I was a genius because I figured out a song on two strings. Walk right in, sit right down. Dan, dan, don, dan, 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 dan. They go, this guy's a genius. So I take the guitar over to my buddy Paul's house, and he goes, man, you're missing four strings on the guitar. <laughs> From that point on, it's been downhill. <laughs> Just kidding. So, you know, so they bought you the other four strings. They bought me the other four strings, finally. And then I went over to Paul, and we were messing. You know, we were trying to play surf music and stuff. But How old were you? Uh, 14 when I first started. And then uh, uh, another guy that I went to Catholic school is uh, Danny Baradat. His his brother Ray was in the Charades, which is a big band. Not 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 a big band physically, but a popular Famous, band. Yeah. yeah, they were more like a doo-wop band. But the band, Pascal Pena, this tough-looking Mexican guy, you know, with a pompadour and the whole bit with a strat, old beat-up strat. He was amazing. And that was like a hero to me, just, just that kind of R&B music, but no blues yet. And then like I told you earlier, I found a 45 at a garage sale of Lightning Slim. That was my first introduction to hearing anything remotely with real blues. And I thought, this is cool. And so didn't really start getting into finding blues because they didn't know anything about it, you know, until I moved to San Jose. And 
listening to FM radio, underground radio, they called it. I think it was Buddy Guy on uh-huh. top. And I go, this is some cool stuff here, man. And so was that 67 or something like that? Yeah, I think about the beginning of 67. And then, you know, then that particular year is the first year I started going to the Fillmore. Right. And then you see everything. And I just had to, a lot of times I'd walk out on blue cheer, you know. <laughs> I remember sticking whole cigarettes in my ear back then. And they were so, you know, they're they in, were my favorites. They're in the Guinness Book of World Records. The, the world's loudest, loudest band, band right? The world, and you know what it, it practiced like? on a pier. <laughs> it just was like white noise, like this. <laughs> I'm thinking, I got to get out of here. I can do a good impression of that. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. But I mean, I saw so many great things there. You know, Albert King. Sanders. I think you told me about a show one time that was Fleetwood Mac and 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 uh, Buddy and Freddie or something. I, I can't well, remember what well, who Buddy, it was. Buddy played with with Peter Green on one night. They had a, right, big, a right. battle like. I remember you told me a great great lineup of, of those guys. Oh, it was yeah. always great. In Two dollars to get in back then. It's incredible, man. Uh, Elvin Bishop called me one time, and I was telling him about this. He couldn't remember this at all. How they used to make those amoeba lights, they go. They'd offer you a hand bill, $2, to, or you know, a ticket for the next show, or a tab of acid <laughs> to sit there. They, they'd get like 12 people with pie plates. Right, and right, right, right. And water in there. Right. And they'd just be going like this the whole time. And i go, <laughs> not me. I came to hear music, man. I don't want to be sitting there just like a dodo going like this all the time. And then within right. about three months, they were replaced with automation. Right. They were, they were out of there. No, I remember <laughs> hearing about that, that that's how they did the that's show. That's how they did yeah. it. Now, your mom was a singer. I remember you were telling me she was working a lot around San Jose. But basically, basically at one place, 17 West. Uh-huh. 18 years she was there. And that was like a jazz, kind of a jazz club? No, it was a, yeah, but I mean, it was or standard, a lounge or standards. What? Yeah, standards. So yeah. ballads and things like that. It was a great food like place, too. Yeah. So the Fillmore was was obviously a pretty big influence Absolutely. in terms of opening things up Absolutely. to you. But my, yeah. my life really changed when I met Gary Smith. Right. And and was that 68, 69? No, no. I think it was actually 71. I was I was living right across from the bodega next to the fire station with Rob Alvarado. That was in Campbell? Yes. Yeah. I had a little alcove room where I used to come in through the window. And there was my bed, which was like a couch during the day. And so one day Rod goes, hey, you know Gary Smith? And I go, never met him, but I just saw him at the Iron Apple about two months ago. They sounded great. Because to me, I, I listened to it. I go, there's a band I'd like to get in right there. So he said, Gary's coming over. And I'm going, really? I go, do you know Gary? And he goes, no, but he's he's coming over. To, he goes, and he goes, Ed, Ed Campbell's coming over. That was our drummer. Right. You know, so... Basically, Gary came over with Robin Porg. Uh, Robin started playing, you know, he had his Super 400. And he's bending over backwards in the living room. I go, what is this? What's going on here? Right? <laughs> and basically, he was trying to steal our drummer. Ah. He was just wanting to see Ed. Ed, Ed Campbell. Ed, Ed, yeah. Ed Campbell had right. the 28-inch bass drum. Right. Robin left, and then Gary goes, hey, let's play something. So he goes, hey, you, you listen to Lockwood? And I go, never heard Lockwood who? He goes, Robert Lockwood. I go, never heard of him. He goes, you're... You're sliding on chords just like Lockwood. I go, never heard it. So he goes, are you hungry? This is, Gary's going to love this part. And I go, yeah. And he goes, you got any money? I go, I, I got not. I got like six bucks. And he goes, let's go to the store. So Gary steals a couple of eggs. <laughs> we go in there and he comes out. I go, did you get anything? And he goes, let's go. So he comes back to the house and he goes, I got two eggs, man. Let's eat. <laughs> so he cooks them up. That was our first meeting. So he asked me, hey, man, would, would you like to join the band? I go, yeah, sure. So that's where I came to the 101 house. Right. Now, did you move right in or how that how that worked out? Pretty much so. I think I waited like a month. Uh-huh. And I just went over there and never came back. Right next door was a shed that was Guitar Player Magazine. That's how we met. Really? Dan, that's how we met Dan Fort. Wow. Too much. Right next to that place was That's guitar, crazy. the original guitar player magazine. And did Dan Fort start that? that was I he one of the? I he was know. one of the early writers, though. He was. Yeah. He was from yeah. there from the beginning. Okay. So, um, from what I understood about 101, it was like 
you and Steve Gomes, the bass player, and Gary Smith all live in there. That's right. But everybody, everybody apparently, out. yeah, Muscle White was there all the time. It was an open Alberto, door. Alberto, Gianquente, Sid Morris, uh, Tucker was there all the time. All the time. All these people were. We used were, to drive Tucker. Right. Because he didn't drive at all. Ever. Right. Now, was he living in the area or was no, he up he, in Marin? He was up there in San Rafael or wherever. Oh, he was in San Rafael. He okay. was living above this. Yeah. You know, his card said it was a suite, but it was above a liquor store. So it was just a little <laughs> shack looking thing. Right, right. But I mean, everybody wanted him to play with him. Yeah, I well, mean, of course. Fenton Robinson. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Hooker. Yeah. Uh, you know, Cotton. Even when Matt Murphy was in there, they both play together. Right. You know, right. so we just pick him up and, you know, it was, it was, it was an unbelievable learning experience just watching that stuff. You just know? having all those guys around you. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember the first album that I got that had you on it was the Blue Bay record. Oh, yes, 1976. Yeah. So that was 76, and I remember Luther Tucker being on it, uh, Skip Rose, I think, was on it. Ron Thompson. Ron Thompson, uh, Muscle White, uh, Gary Smith, you. High Tide Harris. High Tide Harris, Sunny Rhodes. That's right. Yeah. It's a good, it was a good time. It's a good record, yeah. And it was like all you guys seemed like you were in that that San Jose Bay Area scene back then. That's right. So yeah, I mean, you guys were really kind of the introduction, at least for me, you guys were kind of the introduction of, of the blues scene in the Bay Area for me. I heard a lot of bands. Yeah. I think that's one of the best bands at that time playing blues. You know? Gary and you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really do. Well, yeah, yeah, you guys had, uh, and, we and you, you also people. had, uh, who was the horn player? Uh, Kenny Baker. Kenny Baker, right. Yeah. Kenny Baker was on a lot of gigs. Great, right. And from what I gather, I mean, Gary was really kind of doing what I ended up doing later on, which was finding blues people and getting them gigs and setting up small tours in the Bay Area. Like he'd have like John Lee Hooker, you know, you guys would be backing him or Tucker or uh, uh, Mike Bloomfield, Nick Gravenitis. Yeah. He, you guys would kind of back. And I, and I know at one point you guys worked with Otis Rush, right? Oh, yeah. That yeah. was at the Great American Music Hall. Right. That was amazing. But All I know is he was kind of depressed and stuff, you know. And Otis was? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but he sounded amazing. Phew. Yeah. Got him a basement. Do yeah. you remember what year that was? Uh, I think it was around 72 or 3. Didn't you do that tour with Gary and Alberto? Yeah. Where you went to Lincoln, Nebraska and Here's how that maybe happened. Milwaukee. Here's how that happened. You, you got to back up a little bit. Okay. We went to Rick's Blues Bar. In Venice, that was the big deal. It was a tiny right. little club, you know, that had a bunch of mirrors in it to make right. it look bigger. But they had the best jukebox I've ever heard in my life. Back in the day, back in those days, Motel Sixes really cost six bucks. Right, right. <laughs> but we were only making fifteen dollars a night. Right. And all the beer you could drink. Yeah. So we would flip a coin to see who's going to get, you know, because you put two people in a room. Like one guy got the box springs and one right. guy got the mattress on the floor. And yeah. I always wanted the mattress on the floor. Right. And nine out of ten times, I always got that. Ma but this time, I got the fucking box spring. So I ended up sleeping with this girl on the back of Ed's Datsun. Right. Because he had a shell on the back. Right. right. And I ended up getting crabs. Oh. <laughs> that was, was a normal thing back then. Oh, it was that was no a fun. normal thing. It was yeah. no fun, man. Getting the clap and the crabs was just part of the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't have that in the 60s and 70s, you weren't living. That's right. Right? But anyway, that's where we, that's where we picked... Alberto up. Wow. So we you just, found we, him we, in we, LA. Well, he was, but wasn't he from San Francisco? Yeah. He grew, he, he grew up on the South side. Was he living in LA at the time? Kind of meandered around. Yeah. He was one of them guys that just kind of just. Yeah. Because I, I, I saw him at the Ash Grove with Charlie Musselwhite the first, there you go. first time. Yeah. So how did, how did it ended up being uh, Alberto with you guys on the road? How did that come about? We just asked him to go come with us. At that, at that time, every club had an upright piano or a grand piano in it. Right. And he'd bust those those pianos up, man. He played so damn hard, you know? Yeah. For people that don't know it, Alberto Gianquente was uh, the piano player that was with James, the first James Cotton Blues Band. He had played with, didn't he play with James Brown and B.B. King as well, I B. B. think? B.B. King. Yeah, B.B. King. And he was uh, a white piano player but he was well he uh, wasn't white well he, he was, was half puerto rican half, half puerto rican and right half italian right 
And he ended up in James Cotton's original band, which was just a killer, killer band with Luther Tucker on guitar, Francis Clay, Bobby Anderson. And uh, he ended up basically getting famous because of Santana, I remember. Well, here's the story. The second, second album or something. Santana went to school with him. Right. On the South Side, right? So they, they kind of lost track of each other. They were in Texas. And uh, Alberta was with B.B. King playing, and Santana was headlining. And Santana's out in the audience, and, and Alberta sees him. And all of a sudden, he goes backstage. He goes, hey, brother, how you doing? He goes, man, you, you hit the big time with B.B. He goes, I hate it. He goes, why do you hate it? He goes, boring. Just boring, man. I, you know, I'm just get a few solos, and I'm just playing. He goes, it's the same stuff every night. He goes, well, come with us. He goes, all right. So he, he left. Wow. From Texas. Wow. And then that was that was then then in the last days of the Fillmore movie, he, he got eighty thousand bucks. Jeez. For because he because he arranged Oyo Como Va. Right. And he music. also ended up writing a song on the second album. Too. Yeah, I can't remember yeah. the name of it. Incident at Nesbar that, that's or something it. like that. That's right. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. Right. But he could play anything. Though. Oh, he was oh, an he was amazing great. musician. But a hero. I learned addict. so much from that guy. Did you? I, I really did. Yeah. Just I about chords it. and you know I how to really you know music, you know? right? Because he was a he was a real musician, you know. Right, sure was. But he got into some crazy stuff, yeah. you know. But he, huh. was, he was a character. He was a character, a great great musician. You ended up leaving Gary and getting with Piazza for all Rod Piazza for a while. Now, did you guys meet at that Rick's Blues Bar gig? Nope. I played one gig with Rod in '76. I think it was 78, 77 or 78. 78, you were definitely with him because I saw you guys at the Blues Festival. Here, here's what happened. Gomes was going. Gomes was playing with Rod before me. Right. He was coming down to L.A., backing up T-Bone and all these guys, you know, through, right. through Rod. Right. So so all of a sudden, Rod's got this tour with George, Smokey Wilson. Uh, let's see, who else was in the car? Johnny Dyer, Shaky Jake. I, I, Pee Wee wasn't there. That, that was it. Okay. At the Eugene Hotel. Oh, that was up in Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. No, no. Well, we're still. Let's, let's okay. keep it in San Jose right. for a second. Right. So, so Gomes, so Rod goes, "Who can I get on this thing?" And he goes, "What about Watson?" He goes, "Who's that?" He didn't even remember me. Right. I don't think he even knew my name when I did that first gig, right? So, so Gomes, or Gomes goes, "Is Rod goes? Is there any recordings of it?" So he played that harmonic instrumental on Blue Bay. Right. Rod goes, "That's all the guitar I need to hear, just yeah. rhythm." Right. So that's how I got that that thing with Rod, and basically, I just stayed right at that point. And Gomes was in there for the first year, and we were going up to Bend, Oregon, and stuff with with George. Right. And then Gomes moved away, and then I just called Bill in there, and, and he started up. That was just, that was that was it. Because so now was that we the Chicago Flying the, Saucer Band? Is that what that was? No, called? it was actually the L.A. Midnight Groove. Oh, that's right. And That's then, right. then we changed the name to the the first record's called the Flying Saucer Band. Mm -hmm. The album, and that was eighty one or something, or was no, that no, that's that was in the seventy seventy nine. Okay, seventy nine. Okay, yeah, that's, that's when you guys kind of went out and just did your own thing for a while, and you ended up with uh, Muscle White for a year. For a year. Yeah. Yep. Here's yeah. a here's a highlight of that tour. We're playing the bottom line, and there's Doc Thomas in a wheelchair sitting in front of me. And I went, this guy wrote. Million sellers, <laughs> right. man. Yeah, Lonely <laughs> Avenue, and yeah, amazing. Yeah, what was? Didn't he write some Elvis songs? He wrote yeah. uh, Little Sister and a whole bunch, a whole of, bunch yeah. of songs, man. So uh, let me ask you this: Why do you think you ended up with so many harmonic players? Was it just something about the way you played guitar behind them that they? I think I was, you know, the thing. The thing about me when I, like I was telling you about learning all rubber soul and everything, I figured yeah. out chords first. Most right. guitar players don't. They right, want, they want to learn leads first, right? Right. So I think that's the thing. My my whole salvation is playing a bunch of chords. Right. And I just never never concentrated on solos. Yeah. You know, until yeah. I watched everybody else, and I got to figure out Man, yeah. I can do that too. And then when you heard guys like Robert Junior Lockwood, you could see how harmonica players would dig that. Exactly. A guy that was that was able to play support to the harmonica. Plus the fact, you know, talking to Shaky Jake, he said that Walter was a hell of a guitar player for everything, and he told right. a lot of those guys what to play, too. Interesting. And he yeah. said, here's the amazing, I got this on tape. He he, he would adjust the amp. Walter like, would? Wa wa yeah, while, while, wow. while Lockwood was playing, he put more bass on it. 
What a Because he goes, one guy, because I, I asked Jake, I go, did they, did they, did, did Leonard Chess give them that sound or did they have the sound live? He goes, oh, they had the sound live. Yeah, that's what I heard. He yeah. goes, Tucker yeah. played treble right. and Lockwood played bass. Yeah. And they never hardly ever yeah. switched up because Tucker only played treble. Yeah, because I asked, I asked Jimmy Rogers one time, I go, how much of what you guys did in the studio, how much of that was, was Leonard Chess and how much was you guys? He goes, it was all us. That's right. He goes, we had our sound in the studio. Leonard just told us when to start and when to stop, and that was it. And that was Shakey's big deal. He goes, let's play quiet. Because Rod started right. getting loud, but he'd always go right. like this, man. Well, I remember that was what, I remember when I first saw you guys, uh, you know, play down. I went to a gig, I remember one time in. Uh, Avila Beach. Yeah. Avila Beach. Yeah, that's right. I saw you guys at that, that place on the pier. Oh, shit, yeah. I remember. remember that? Yeah. I, I got a photo of you guys playing it. And I remember you guys had the smallest little amps. And I was so impressed that, that you guys man. played at such a, a low volume. That's the way those guys played. Yeah. Really and it did. is how they played. Yeah. You figure in 1952 when they did Juke, there was no big amp. No. Sure. No way. And I remember, yeah. the, remember the Living Blues, you know, they had the article on, I think it was Lewis Myers and Walter talking. Right. And he says, because everybody tried to figure out what is the amp they're using and all this stuff. He right. Goes, yeah, I remember he had this old amp, man. It kept messing up, making a bunch of noise. He goes, what was it? He goes, international. <laughs> That's a tractor. You know? It was a national. I know. That's what it was. But yeah, he said yeah. it was two pieces, you know. Well, right. I had to be like a commando or something. Yeah, Who knows exactly. What? Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it was like a PA system. Is what. That's what Dave Myers told me. He had like these columns that he would set in the club. And he said they had little eight inch or six inch speakers and he would set them all through the club, like no, well, four actually, of them. Actually, Jake said a lot of clubs had built in speakers in the wall. True. Metal yeah. ones. And he said, right. And Walter noticed that, you know, they'd have the Masco PA up there. And he goes, when he was in the audience before, while the band was playing before he got up there, he goes, you could hear the vocals coming out of everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. That's when he started playing through the mic. Wow. What it, a trip. Because the harp was everywhere. Sure, we'd and be Jake, everywhere. I go, well, were you in there when this was going on? And Jake goes, you could hear it. I mean, it sounded amazing. That's what I heard, yeah. yeah. You know, it had that three-dimensional thing going. You know, right. Where you hear it coming off the stage and, and right next to you. Right, right. Uh, that must have been something. Pretty amazing, yeah. And the funny thing is, I mean, I always heard Walter played through all kinds of different gear. I got to tell this story. Okay. This has nothing to do with that. Yeah. I just thought of this, and it's a good one. So I asked Jake, I go, when's the first time you saw Helen Wolf? He goes, 1948 in West Memphis, Arkansas. And I go, what, what was what was it like? He goes, well, first of all, they had circus banners with Helen Wolf with a man's body with like a wolf head with like fangs <laughs> and stuff on these posters. And everybody goes, he goes, you know, black people are superstitious. He goes, and everybody, they kept playing, bombarding the radio shows, with nothing but wolf songs, right? And everybody kind of got scared to come down there, right? So they paid their 35 cents to get in and the curtains were closed. And when, when the curtains opened up, the band starts going ding dong, and he's in a cage with a wow. big padlock on the front of it. And he's Whoa. going like this. He's going like this, right? And the cage, the, the padlock's rattling like that and everybody's eyes are all bugged out. That's Jake's great. going like this. He goes, hey, we're going like this. And he goes, they started throwing pennies, nickels and dimes and shit. And all of a sudden, he, it, it had a trap door in the back of it, so he just pushed it down like this, and two guys just carried that thing away, and the, and the show started. How wild! I, I go, that's really. He goes, he goes, all that's gone. And you yeah. know, George used to talk about up in Bend, Oregon. You know, after the shows, he had you know had like five, six drinks. He'd tell right. these stories. Right? He right. says everybody had a show back then. Yeah, yeah. He goes, that's the thing. That's what's missing now about yeah. those. That's what kind of upset him. Interesting. He goes, because even a guy like. J.B. Lenore, man, he'd play behind his head and between his legs and shit because everybody tried to compete with each other. Right. But he, but it was a show. Yeah. And it was entertainment. Yeah. He goes, entertainment is lost in blues at that time. Yeah. That's what he, that's what he said. I believe that, yeah. So. Well, they definitely had like the head cutting contests and stuff. Oh, yeah, there was, was a lot of that going on. Time. So that's another guy I wanted to ask you about is is working with George Smith because I know you and you and Rod did a ton of shows with George. A lot of, a lot of shows. Yeah. And uh, what, what were some of the highlights of working with him? Well, the best best one we ever did with him where I really saw him at his peak performance was at a ghetto club in Santa Barbara, believe it or not. And there's a shoe shine parlor thing and the rib joint in the front with funny lettering on it. 
and this black club. And this lady ran it. So here was the show. Mighty Flyers, George, Pee Wee, Johnny Dyer, uh, sh uh, Shaky Jake. So okay. first was, was Shaky, and he does long distance call, and he starts running around the mic this way. And he's, she goes, and she went like this. And he, then he starts going, yeah, and he starts getting dizzy, and he starts grabbing the microphone and almost falls over. So the next is Pee Wee. Right. And, he come, and they're vying for this woman behind the bar. So everybody's uh -huh. like really shooting their shot. All right. So Pee Wee does the splits and he can't get up. <laughs> <laughs> so he's stretched out like this and he goes, hey, Johnny, get, get me up. And Johnny comes up there and gets him out of his feet. That's George, like a James Brown. <laughs> and, and then who, who was after that? George. Never saw George do this. I'm going to take my hat off for a second to do this one. So, so the girl by this point, because it started getting good to her. She was like sitting in the, one of the first row. Right. So George does a somersault over to her with him, and he's got the chromatic. So he's right in front of her and he goes like this. He grabs his hair and he just goes like this. <laughs> and and his, his, his forehead just looked like an accordion. And the girl, and he's over there. I'm, I'm trying to play, but I'm trying to watch it to him. And the girl's just going, like this to George. And he, so he started buying her salty dogs. He bought her 14 of them, right? So I, so his room was right next to mine when the show was over. Uh -huh. And the doors cracked like that. And I go, hey, George. And, he, and he's got his underwear on. He's got his nylon socks going with suspense. <laughs> Like suspender hooks right. on him, right? <laughs> and, he, and he's got his black nylon shirt on. And he goes, Mike, I bought that damn woman fourteen <laughs> salty dogs, and she jilted me. <laughs> I go, hey man, you win some and you lose some, George. But at least you got to see that. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. You ever see Cotton do a somersault? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. I never got to he see that. He was skinny then too. Right. Right. That was a hell of a band. Sure was. Oh, yeah. Tell me some stories about Pee Wee, too. Well, I... Because I, I saw Pee Wee. The best night I ever saw him was on one of your, you and Rod's oh, gigs. Man, we, I played so many times with him. He amazing. really played great the he, night he I was saw him. He amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you how I met him. So we were doing a show at the... What's the name of that famous jazz club in, in Hermosa Beach? The Lighthouse. Oh, the Lighthouse, yeah. So it was a big blues festival. It was a two-day event. And I, I have a poster somewhere of it. And I can't remember all the people, but Johnny Hartsman was definitely there because he begged me to join his band. And I go, what am I going to do? I, I'm in this band. He goes, right. he goes, hell with them. Come with me. And I go, I can't do it. So we're backing up. We're going to do like four songs with, with uh, Smoke, Smokey Wilson. Right. So we, we did a sound check, and then we went across the street to eat. So I had a brown Barberlux sitting on a milk crate and a reverb tank. When I come back, my stuff's move out of uh, moved out of the way, and all of a sudden, this half stacked Marshall's there, and I'm going, "What the hell?" So I don't say nothing to anybody. I just move it back against the wall, and all of a sudden, this little short guy comes running past me and goes, "Rod, this damn guitar player just moved your, my my amp." And and Rod goes, "How's this young man gonna play a show with your big ass amp in the way, Pee Wee?" And I go, "Pee Wee Creighton." Wow. Well, it was a hell of a way to meet a guy. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So anyway, what happened? This is the end of it. So we play the set, and, and I didn't even know George was in the place, period, because it's so dark in there, and you're playing right to the bar. So Rod walks out into the audience and hands the mic to George, and I went, oh, my God, George, as he starts coming up. Well, Pee Wee was sitting in front of me. He's drinking, smoking, and chewing gum. <laughs> so he's watching us. He's going like... <laughs> and all of a sudden he sees George and his 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 Les Paul was leaning up against that half stack Marshall right. right. So when George comes up there, he stops the band and goes da 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 and he starts going. And all of a sudden Pee Wee runs and grabs his guitar, almost knocks me over, and he hits this G. It was in G. I remember that because he just I looked back and Pee Wee just goes Ding! loud as hell, and I just went back and turned his amp down to our volume. <laughs> So once again, as soon as that thing's over with, he goes right past me. He goes, Rod, this damn guitar player turned my up. And I go, hey, man, how are we going to do gonna You're going to come out with your orchestra and back up Joe Turner. Right, right. So that Crazy. Was how, that's how I met Pee Wee.
I'm talking with Junior Watson a little more about guitar players. Like uh, you just mentioned to me about playing playing side to side with Luther Tucker and how you couldn't really play any of his stuff when you're. Well, I just felt you know it's just not kosher, really. To right, do that kind right, of thing. exactly. Just, plus the fact that I respect the guy, you know, and I just you know. Yeah. But it was kind of stifling because I was just, I learned a lot of his stuff. You did, yeah, yeah. And you just don't do that kind of thing. Right, <laughs> right. You did so many sessions with so many great people over the years. Didn't you do a, a Johnny Dyer record? Yep. Aren't you on some of that? Yep. Yeah. And and then uh, the George Smith album, which I love. Yeah. And then uh, boogieing with George. Yeah, boogieing with George. And then the other one is the Jimmy Rogers record. I got to tell you a funny one on that. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. That was the uh, Ted Brinson studio. That's where the Hollywood Fats Band did their record. It took them a year to make that record. You know. Wow. <laughs> but I got I got to talk about the Jimmy Rogers yeah. record. Right. The Jimmy Rogers, that was done in 83. Right. And I just go, I go, the Jimmy Rogers? Because you never know. Now, what's the, he goes, yeah. And he showed up. And from the minute he walked in, it was the most relaxed session I've ever been on in my life. The Rod got him a basement to play through. You know, he had that 335 or whatever it was he had. And we adjusted the amp, you know. And he just go, key of A. And we just started. And it just you know, it was just one of those magical deals. It was you know I just tried to stay out of his way, you know. But it, but we got a lot of intertwining stuff going on there. And then eventually, you know, he was drinking a little bit, you know, as it went on. And then finally, he just goes, he just sets the guitar down. And he goes, "You got it from here on out." And I go, "Really?" I go, "What's this thing that you're going to do? He's going to do, what is the name of it? Slick Chick." Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. I go, "How's it go?" And he says something or another, and I go, hey, Willie, Willie Schwartz. I go, you know that song, Keep Pleasing Me by Nappy Brown? I go, do that drum fill in the middle of this thing. And so we, we do it. And he's looking over, and he's smiling at me. And I go, this is great. <laughs> the guy's happy. Yeah. And then he started telling stories. Let me tell, tell the story at the end of this thing. So Honey goes like this. She says, you know that picture? It's on calendars and stuff where you guys are picking cotton. Is that real? And Jimmy Rogers goes, well, yeah. She goes, I thought it was staged. She goes, no. We used to go a lot. If everybody was off on a Sunday, we'd go out there because we'd make it like a dollar an hour and just tell stories. Wow. That, was a, that was the best times we all had together because everybody would just tell stories. So he was saying that basically they would just stop by the side of the road and no, they they had places to go. They knew they knew people. So they had, knew who they could meals. go pick cotton for, and they just do it just to get away from their wives and tell stories. Wow, and this was make this was months. before they were in Chicago. No, it's in Chicago. In Chicago. In Chicago. When they'd go down south and tour. Exactly. Wow. It's amazing. Wild. Yep. Because you see well. a bunch of different guys. There's two or three of those pictures with different guys in them. Well, I've seen the one. It's got like Wolf and Cotton and Little Walter and. One of them has Sonny Boy in it, too, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. We did a lot of shows with Jimmy Witherspoon with Tucker. Oh, uh, we, okay. We wow. opened up. Wow. And that was that was a lot of fun, too, right. hanging out with all those guys and talking to them. So would Tucker back up Spoon? No, he'd play with us. Oh, he'd play with you guys. Tuck, okay. uh, Robin Ford was in that band. Right, oh, that's I right. Tell you, I better not. Cause no, he, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I could really get in trouble on this one. Really? Yeah, you don't want to Change the names. Uh, I don't want to say it. <laughs> I better not. Okay, we'll save that for the archives, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 